the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the Sunday before Theophany. Theophany is Wednesday. And it's part of, sort of connected with the Nativity of our Lord. We have the Nativity, which is the beginning. And then the Lord fulfilled a great portion of his ministry in Theophany. Theophany means appearance of God. We might call it the baptism of Christ also. During the baptism of Christ, of course, we know that when he came out of the water, that the, the voice of the Father came from heaven and then the dove landed around his shoulders and that was a symbolism of the, the appearance of the Holy Trinity. So that's why we call it a theophany. What is it that we celebrate when we celebrate the baptism of Christ? We celebrate our baptism. And I really find no better way to describe the theophany, what happened in the baptism of Christ, and therefore what happens to us because of that baptism, by, than by reading portions of the services. I'm always harping on you about reading the services. They're so available now. When I became an Orthodox Christian, there were very few books available. And, you know, we had to read them by a kerosene lantern and everything. But now everything's available. It's on the Internet now. You can get it on a mailing list. And there's really no excuse not to read the services. I cut my teeth on them. I read them over and over again. And of course, then I of course stood in the services and listened and tried to pray as the words were sung. So what I want to do is talk to you about a few stikera from the canon of nativity. Evidently, I'm not being very original here because I always mark the services. So I have a one and a two and a three and a four by certain of these things. So I must have talked about it before, but that might have been 15 years ago. And who remembers that? I don't even remember what I said. So I want to talk to you just about some, just in no particular order, just in the order that I seem to have come up with years ago so that we can see something of the beauty of the baptism of Christ, what it does for us. And if you know what it does for you, then go ahead and do it. We have to know what it does in order to do it. You have to have some inspiration to do it. So here's one. The master draweth to himself the divinely fashioned nature of man, which hath been overcome by the tyranny of greed. And he restoreth mortal men, granting them a new birth, and accomplishing thereby a mighty work, for he has come to cleanse our nature. I'm sure that's why I mark this with my three X's and my circle and my number one, to cleanse our nature. That's what Christianity is, to make us completely clean, completely pure. Isn't that a beautiful idea? Huh? But it's not just an idea. It's the truth. It's what's going to happen. It's what's happening now. I talk to you often about feeling things in your heart, learning to look inside your heart or just feel in your heart when something's good or bad. You feel the darkness in your heart, you know there's sin. You feel the coldness in your heart, you know there's sin. You feel the muck in your heart, you know there's sin. And sometimes your heart feels enlightened and feels sort of opened. And you feel light in your heart and you feel warmth in your heart and then you know God is visiting you. You have to learn to listen to your heart. You have to learn to live in your heart. That's where life is lived. It's not lived with the fingers and with the toes and with the legs and with the arms and with the brain. Life is lived in the heart. And God came to cleanse our heart, to cleanse our nature. He took on our nature, which was corrupt. He took on a corrupt nature. And he made it incorrupt. His nature, that is, his human nature, he made incorrupt. Then he made us capable of obtaining that same level of incorruption, complete freedom from death, by baptism. And then all the subsequent things that happen after baptism. Because after all, if a person is baptized and then goes back to the life they are living, they're just like a dog back to their vomit. And it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. He came to cleanse our nature. I never heard that when I was a Protestant. I just heard he came to take on our punishment so that we wouldn't be punished. It wasn't really much about change. Maybe mentioned a little bit, but not very much. 
For us, it's the whole point. Jesus Christ came taking on our corrupt nature in order to make it incorrupt, to cleanse it. And the medium by which we begin that process is the water of baptism. We really can't meditate upon this too much, that God came to cleanse our nature. But that only really hits home with a person if they know that their nature is not very clean. Most of us really don't have much awareness of our sins, of how dirty we really are. If you draw closer to God, then you start to realize how really there's a lot of dirt in there. There's a lot of muck in there. And God came to help us get rid of all of it, to get a shovel and shovel it out. He will help us to do that. That's the whole purpose of the Incarnation. And the baptism of Christ is part of fulfilling that purpose. So here's number two. O Church of Christ, who of old was barren and grievously childless, be glad today, for by water and the Spirit children have been born unto thee who cry out with faith, there is none holy as our God. And the reason I circled this one is because when I saw this lament about the Church of Christ who of old was barren and childless, I thought of virtues, I thought of, of holiness. We were barren of virtues and holiness until Christ came. For the Jews, their interaction with God was that, was that they would do sacrifices and he would forgive them their sins. But they didn't really understand anything about the human soul growing to perfection. And even today, most people's Christianity does not include that idea that we should be like a mother giving birth to children. And those children should be our virtues, should be our kindness to one another, should be our heart grieving for those who are in some desperate circumstance, should be our prayer with tears and with prostrations. And those should be our virtues. And many others, of course, their humility and and uh, our purity and all of those other things. Those are like giving birth as a mother to a child. And we have that capability now of being infinitely able to give birth. Not as a mother can, only from, you know, the years of from early teens till maybe 50, 55 at the very latest. That's very old for a mother, generally. Only a short portion of years we can infinitely be able to give birth to children, virtues. We're capable of that because of baptism. I really believe that people have a, a need to be creative. And that creativity is not what I, I'm not talking about being artistic or musical or being able to write or something like that. Of course, if you do those things, those are wonderful things to do. And they express something of ourselves when we do them. But I'm talking about this creativity that we can always, in every situation, be able to do what is beautiful and right. To give birth to something good and holy in everything we do. That creativity Jesus Christ had. That ability to create Jesus Christ had. And he gives it to us. So we're no longer barren. I really think one of the big problems of the modern world is people don't, they have this barrenness inside them. They live according to the things that they know, the things that they like, the things that they dislike. They might be kind, they might try to be good to people, but they don't understand how amazingly beautiful it is that we can do something that's holy. Then we are participating in the holiness of God, in the infinite creativity of God. It's an amazing thing to do that. It's a great privilege to be able to help someone, to pray for someone, to give them a word of comfort or help them in any way whatsoever or to pray with tears for them or with a prostration for them even if they never know and even if they die not knowing that we prayed for them because God sees those things and whatever God creates does not ever disappear. God made us and we are permanent. We are holy are we becoming holy, but we are eternal. Because God does not go back on his word. 
So we can participate in that activity. It's an incredible privilege if we thought about that doing good works in terms of that, I think we would be more motivated instead of thinking, well, I have to do this stuff. I have to do it because, well, I'm supposed to. No, you have to do it because it is you. Because if you have God within you, then that is who you are, to be infinitely creative, to no longer be barren. We're celebrating uh, on the Feast of Theophany that we can be born and we can therefore continue giving birth. It's really a wonderful and amazing, amazing thing. And we should remember this. I don't mean like, you know, you should think about it as you're doing your day, you're going about your day. But I think it should be the thing that motivates you in every way. You can participate in God by loving his people in an infinitely creative way. And here's number three. The creator beholding him whom he had formed of dust, bound by inescapable bonds in the darkness of sin, raised him up and laid him on his shoulders. And now in the midst of abundant waters, he washeth him clean from the ancient shame of Adam's sinful inclination. How many of us that are fathers or mothers have taken a sleeping child out of the car late at night, borne them in our arms, and brought them to bed? Uh -huh. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Those are wonderful moments when you do that with your child. They're completely dependent on you, and you're just taking care of them. You're burying them, aren't you? They can't do it without you. They're too sleepy. Often they don't even wake up. And even if they did wake up, they're, they're just out of sorts, and they maybe can't walk. You have to bear them to bed. The Lord took us upon his shoulders. And in fact, we're still on his shoulders. We're not alone. Sometimes we feel alone. We're in a strange world where we have so many people, so many connections, so much ability to communicate, and almost none of it means anything. And almost none of it makes us feel that we actually have a connection. But Jesus Christ will bear us on his shoulders always, all the time. That's what he did when he was allowed himself to be baptized because he imbued water with the capability of giving us eternal life. That's, that's what happened. It wasn't just as a sort of a photo op. It wasn't so that it could be recorded as something that was really magnificent and the, and the Holy Spirit could manifest himself. It was so that he would change the nature of water and to this day when a priest prays, that water changes, the Holy Spirit inhabits the water and all the demons are, are thrust out of the water. And when a person descends into that water, they're buried. And that sinful part of them, that part of them that won't be able to change, dies. And then they come up a new creature, alive, different, able to become perfected. That's what happens in baptism. And from the point of our baptism onward, just like the, from the point of a baby being born onward, Christ is there for us, just as parents are there for their child. Now, of course, we grow to a certain maturity, and then our parents, of course, they actually get older, and they get more feeble, and we take care of them, and they die. But our Lord Jesus Christ doesn't ever become feeble. From the point of our baptism, from the point of our rebirth, he is always with us, always bearing us on his shoulders. Remember that the next time that you feel alone or that you feel despondent or that you feel overcome by your sin, Jesus Christ is right there with you. It's really true. You might not always feel like that, but it's always true. Number four, O unoriginate king, through the communion of the Spirit, thou didst anoint and make perfect the nature of man, cleansing it in the pure streams of baptism, putting the arrogant might of darkness to shame. Thou dost now raise it up to eternal life. So that's kind of a repetition of the third secure that I, that I, and the second one that I read. And it's good to have repetition because this is the most important thing for us to be changed. And what I love about this particular stikir and how it talks about it 
First of all, it makes very clear what our Lord's incarnational ministry was. It was to perfect the nature of man. It wasn't to go die on a cross so that we wouldn't be killed. It was to perfect the nature of man. And then it says, putting to arrogant the arrogant might of darkness to shame. And I think that gives us a clue in neon letters, big sign clue, not a little clue. It tells us exactly how we should live. The thing about the demons is they're arrogant. They're arrogant. Even though they know they're wrong, they won't. They won't admit it. They won't repent. They're arrogant. They're full of arrogance. They're full of spite. They think that they're superior. Even though a part of them knows they're inferior, their arrogance won't let them really believe that or act upon that. So what are we to take from this to Karen? I think that the key to living a, a triumphant life, a good life, a life in which God comes to the heart and enlightens all of it, is to be humble. And I'm not talking about a kind of hum humility where maybe you don't brag about stuff. You shouldn't brag about stuff. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about deep-seated within you, you know that you can do nothing without God. And because of that, you have a certain gratitude in your heart that makes you reach out to others who are not doing things quite right. And you don't, in, in, you don't in, deal with people in an arrogant way. I'm better than that person. Well, maybe you are better, but you're only better by the grace of God. There should be a deep humility within us of where we came from and, and who we are and who, who we are becoming. And if it can happen with us, it can happen with anybody. We should absolutely consider any kind of arrogance to be any kind of pride, any kind of looking down on a person, any kind of classism or anything like that, thinking we're smarter, we're more accomplished, we work harder, uh, we go to church more, we, whatever it is, where we compare ourselves to someone and we come up better than they do, or even for that matter, worse than we do, because that's just kind of the reverse of arrogance. Both of them are destructive. We should consider those things to be absolutely the most toxic thing we can put into our soul. And if we know that we've been saved solely by the grace of God, solely by the love of God, that we don't deserve any of it, then that knowledge that is deep in the heart, that will be the energy which makes us live in the right way. Not with the knowledge that's in our mind, but that deeply within us we know that without God we can't do anything. So this is the key. The key to triumphant life is deep humility about ourselves. Deep humility does not mean that you don't recognize things about yourself. That's just a mind game. If you're better than you were before, that's wonderful. You should recognize it. Give glory to God for it. But you should also recognize that you're only better because of the grace of God. That's all. Now, of course, you put in work. God required of you work, and you did some work. And because of that work, God then gave you more grace. Or, I always think it's weird to say more grace. Because grace is the appearance, is the presence of God in our life. How can God make himself more present? He is always present. I guess what we mean by more grace is God sort of activates within us more, more energy. I, I'm not sure exactly how it works. Uh, I don't think it can be described or understood in, in, any, in any real way. But as you, we do know by experience that as we live the Christian life and start to have these things be internalized, and therefore the, the eternal us, the internal us, acts externally in a way that is kind and good to others, in a way that causes our prayer to be with with intensity and with fervor, in a way that, that just has our moral compass always pointing north, then God enlightens us even more. And the process never ends. It just keeps increasing. This is what we're celebrating in baptism of Christ, that this ability to become perfect begins 
without, without baptism. May God bless you and help you in all things. Amen.